Good evening, everyone. Welcome to ASIO and the Ben Chifley Building. Now, in my mind, you're all VIPs, but there are a few people and groups that I need to acknowledge. So, Excellencies, first and foremost, uh, including, um, if I may call out Shingo, um, my good mate, the Ambassador of Japan. I was a little saddened when you said this might be your last time at the Emperor's birthday celebration the other day, but I did get a chuckle when you said you're not the typical diplomat. It's probably one of the reasons why I like you so much. <laughs> but before people react and take that the wrong way, it's because I'm not the typical spy catcher. Thanks for coming. Elected representatives are members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Inspector General, agency heads, and in particular, Kerry Hartland, new freshly minted Director General of ACES, two days in. Congratulations on your appointment, and I wish you and your agency all the very best for the future. Secretaries, military chiefs, commissioners, and in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Rhys Kershaw, Australian Federal Police Commissioner, and Karen Webb, New South Wales Police Commissioner. The police are a close and important partner for ASIO as we do our jobs, as you'll see tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, and last but not least, I must acknowledge my wife, Rachel, um, for no other reasons other than she's my wife, but actually because she would be able to give this speech if I fall over tonight, because she's heard it more time than any of my staff ever have. <laughs> so thanks for the backup in many things, including tonight. Sadly, there are some notable absences here tonight. In the last year, ASIO lost a number of current and past employees including three former Directors General, Alan Wrigley, John Moten, and David Irvin. To Alan, John, David, and those others I cannot name publicly, I honour your service to ASIO and your contribution to Australia's national security. A journalist once approached David, David Irvin, to ask for a comment, and his answer was classic David. My boy, being a top spook is not compatible with being a media tart. Wise words worth reflecting on, and I'll be pretty confident there's some of you in the room tonight are thinking perhaps not often enough in my case. <laughs> David was right, of course. Intelligence chiefs need to be very careful about what they reveal publicly, and I'll return to that later. But it's also true there are more agency heads making public appearances, both here and Australia, to explain the threats. That's a positive development given the prevailing security environment. In fact, after David retired, he told me he'd wished he'd started delivering annual threat assessments when he was Director General. And at ASIO, public engagements like this are driven by the triple T, T's of threat, trust and team. I want to improve awareness of threats, enhance trust through transparency and build our team by recruiting the best and the brightest. I'll touch on all of these priorities this evening, but in particular, I'll emphasise the threat. Australia is facing an unprecedented challenge from espionage and foreign interference. And I'm not convinced, as a nation, we fully appreciate the damage it inflicts on Australia's security, democracy, sovereignty, economy and social fabric. Tonight, I will detail the scale and scope of this threat and the outstanding work ASIO and our partners do in countering it. Australia cannot be complacent. We must take security seriously. The security environment is complex, challenging and changing. Complex because the threats are increasingly intersecting, emerging from new places and blurring traditional distinctions. A foreign power can simultaneously be interfering, spying and setting up for sabotage. Challenging because Australia is being targeted by sophisticated foreign adversaries that are effectively unconstrained by resources, ethics and laws, and they carefully hide their activities. Changing because the threats are shaped by shifting geopolitics, emerging technologies and broader social trends that include online radicalisation and the growth in extreme views, conspiracies and grievances. This means ASIO must constantly work harder and smarter and better to ensure we continue to protect Australia and Australians from threats to their security. We are embracing the complexity, confronting the challenges and changing our capabilities. And of course, our most important capability is our people. Their agility and ingenuity, dedication and innovation 
allows us to evolve with the threat environment. And we're always on the lookout for creative thinkers who want to make a difference. There's a diversity of roles available across the organisation, from technologists to psychologists, intelligence officers to corporate professionals. And I'd ur urge anyone who's interested to check out our website for the careers on offer, find your fit and join the mission. You'll be able to do things here you cannot do anywhere else. And as I said, you get to make a difference. Late last year, I lowered the national domestic terrorism threat level from probable to possible. This decision was not taken lightly or made casually. ASIO assesses that Australia remains a potential terrorist target, but there are fewer extremists with the intention to conduct an attack on shore than there were when we raised the threat level in 2014. This does not mean the threat is extinguished, far from it. When making the announcement, I said it remained entirely plausible there would be a terrorist attack in Australia within 12 months. And our biggest concern was individuals and small groups who would move to violence without warning, using weapons such as guns. Tragically, all of that came true just a few weeks later. The horrific Weambilla case demonstrates how, even with a lower threat level, our counterterrorism mission remains challenging and the operational tempo is not diminishing. Significant changes and challenges in the onshore security environment are adding to its complexity. The reach of extremist content online means individuals are radicalising very quickly in days and weeks, so the time between flash to bang is shorter than ever. The radicalisation of minors is another concerning trend. Terrorism remains a significant threat in some parts of the world and an emerging menace in others and developments overseas could resonate here in Australia. In our near region, under ISIL's influence, religiously motivated violent extremists are adapting their methods, with suicide bombings becoming more common in the southern Philippines, as well as attacks by females and families in the region more, more broadly. Despite strong counterterrorism pressure in the Philippines and Indonesia, ISIL-aligned violent extremists will continue to plan and conduct simple, often opportunistic attacks, primarily detected against local security forces and sectarian targets over the next six months. More globally, we're following terrorism hotspots in Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. These are places where Australians live and work, where we have business interests and travel. All of these factors means ASIO cannot take its eye off the ball and will continue to work with our national and international partners to disrupt terrorism. And it's almost guaranteed there'll be a moment when a Director General of Security will be standing here to advise that the domestic terrorism threat level is being raised again. For now though, the, le the level remains at possible and that's despite the slaying of two police officers and a civilian in Weambilla. On behalf of ASIO, I again express my sincere condolences to the families of those killed and Queensland Police more broadly. We work closely with many excellent officers in the Joint Counterterrorism Team and I know how deeply these losses are felt. ASIO worked with Queensland Police to assess what motivated the murderers and we reached independent but identical conclusions. We believe the shooting was an act of politically motivated violence primarily motivated by Christian violent extremist ideology. Now, given this matter is still being investigated, I will refrain from going into more detail about ASIO's assessment, other than to say we did not find evidence that the killers embraced a racist and nationalist ideology or were sovereign citizens, despite their anti-authority and conspiracy beliefs. It's disappointing some commentators and self-proclaimed terrorism experts were so quick to make definitive declarations about the motivations, ideologies, and political alignments in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy. Proper, sober, accurate assessments require time and multiple inputs, including intelligence. That's why ASIO is an authority on domestic threats, and we have a unique role in the intelligence community. We are collectors and assessors, as well as disruptors. Our advice does not just draw on open source material. 
We also have access to information obtained through ASIO's investigative and operational activity and from our domestic and international partners. ASIO's experts weigh all available information and use structured analytical techniques to test, retest and contest their assumptions. Speaking more generally, I'm also concerned that all too often, commentators fail to distinguish between extreme views and violent extremism. Yes, one can lead to the other, but that does not mean to say they are the same. It takes careful, nuanced work to disentangle groups and individuals that will engage in violence from groups and individuals that may have views that are awful, but still lawful. It's equally critical to understand that every ideology motivated extremist is not automatically a left-wing or right-wing extremist. There is a cohort of individuals motivated by a toxic cocktail of conspiracies, grievances and anti-authority beliefs. It's neither helpful nor accurate to reflexively assign these individuals to a place on the political spectrum. Now these are not simple semantic or academic distinctions. Words matter, facts matter, actions matter. If we as a community persist in getting the diagnosis wrong, we will struggle to find the cure. While threat to life will always be a priority for ASIO, espionage and foreign interference is now our principal security concern. <coughs> Countering the threats to our way of life is soaking up more and more of our resources. Now I'd like to spend some time explaining what's driving this trend. Australia is part of the most dynamic region in the world, the Indo-Pacific. The region is home to some of the planet's fastest growing populations, fastest growing economies and fastest military build-ups. The Indo-Pacific is home to great power competition, with the power of the United States, our primary ally, being contested by the rise of China and multiple significant territorial disputes, including the South China Sea, Kashmir, the Taiwan Straits, and the Korean Peninsula. Now, there is much more to the Indo-Pacific than this sketch, but suffice to say, ASIO is following the dynamics because they drive security issues. In particular, they're driving a first for inside information and an appetite for covert influence from countries from within inside and outside the region. Multiple nations are using espionage and foreign interference to advance their interests and undermine Australia's. They're using espionage to covertly understand Australia's politics and decision making, our alliances and partnerships and our economic and policy priorities. They are using espionage to recruit to their own cause elected officials, public servants, well-placed individuals in business and leaders in the community. They're using espionage to identify vulnerabilities in essential services and systems that could be exploited in the future and to slow our military modernisation. They're using espionage to steal Australia's intellectual property. They're using foreign interference to shape political and business decision making to their advantage. They're using foreign interference to monitor, threaten and even harm members of diaspora communities. And they're also using foreign interference to manipulate messages among communities through foreign language media and by establishing community organisations. Some of the governments doing these things are considered friends. Others are authoritarian regimes with values very different to ours. Either way, their covert activities they are conducting are neither abstract nor harmless. Stealing our secrets is not like collecting stamps. Espionage is deliberate and damaging. Espionage takes away sovereign choices and options. Espionage steals the advantage of significant investment in research and development. Espionage damages the economy and literally sends businesses bankrupt. Espionage undermines our ability to defend ourselves militarily. Espionage is a reconnaissance tool to shape disinformation campaigns used in our community. Espionage can enable sabotage, foreign interference and more espionage. Espionage is a thousand different effects that chip away at the base of our sovereignty. Having said all that, I'm concerned there are senior people in this country who appear to believe that espionage and foreign interference is no big deal. It's something that can be tolerated or somehow ignored or safely managed. Individuals in business, academia and the bureaucracy have told me 
ASIO should ease up on its operational responses to avoid upsetting foreign regimes. Now, of course, they're entitled to their views, but the reasons they offer are flimsy, such as all countries spy on each other. We're going to make that information public anyway. It's no different to lobbying or networking. And my favourite, the foreign government might make things difficult for us. And so on. Now, in my opinion, anyone saying these things should reflect on their commitment to Australia's democracy, sovereignty and values, because espionage and foreign interference is deliberately calculated to undermine Australia's democracy, sovereignty and values. Based on what ASIO is seeing, more Australians are being targeted for espionage and foreign interference than at any time in Australia's history. More hostile foreign intelligence services, more spies, more targeting, more harm, more ASIO investigations, more ASIO disruptions. And from where I sit, it feels like hand-to-hand -hand combat. This means ASIO is busier than ever before, busier than any time in our 74-year history, busier than the Cold War, busier than 9-11, and busier than the height of the caliphate. That's based on multiple metrics, including our work watching suspected spies and terrorists. In the last year alone, ASIO surveillance officers traversed more than 3 million kilometres. That's the equivalent of 75 laps of Earth. I'd like to highlight one particular and significant successful ASIO operation. In the last 12 months, we detected and disrupted a major spy network. I've previously revealed how we removed a nest of spies. I refer to this latest case as the hive of spies because it was bigger and more dangerous than the nest. The spies were undeclared. In other words, they were working undercover. Some were put in place years earlier. Proxies and agents were recruited as part of a wider network. And among other malicious activities, they wanted to steal sensitive information. Now, I'm not going into more detail because the Foreign Intelligence Service is still trying to unpick exactly what and how we knew about their activities. It's obvious to us the spies were highly trained because they used sophisticated tradecraft to disguise their activities. They were good, but ASIO was better. We watched them. We mapped their activities. We mounted an intense and sustained campaign of operational activity. We confronted them and working with our partners, we removed them from this country privately and professionally. The hive is history. I'm telling you this for two reasons. First, it's an example of ASIO's more aggressive counter-espionage posture. We're stepping up our investigations, expanding our capabilities and sharpening our response and hardening Australia's security environment. As I said in this address three years ago, if you're conducting espionage in this country, we will find you and we will deal with you. It's important to spell this out because our adversaries are not the only, one, only countries that care about whether we take security seriously. As we progress AUKUS, it's critical our allies know we can keep our secrets and keep their secrets. There's another reason for highlighting the hive. I want to dispel any sense that espionage is some romantic Cold War notion it's not. It's a real and present danger that demands we take security seriously. Foreign intelligence services from multiple countries are aggressively seeking secrets about our defence capabilities, government decision making, political parties, foreign policy, critical infrastructure, space technologies, academic and think tank research, medical advances, key export industries and personal data, especially bulk data. Some of the other professions being targeted might surprise you. In the last year, a small number of Australian judicial figures have been subject to suspicious approaches. And while we've yet to conclusively conclude they were targeted by foreign intelligence services, we do know spies want insights into court cases relevant to their governments and are seeking to use litigation as an intelligence collection tool. The foreign spies have been used, have been even more brazen in the United States more recently, seeking to obstruct prosecutions and manipulate outcomes in what is nothing short of an assault on the rule of law. Australian judicial officers are not the only potential victims. There's been a discernible uptick and concern, a discernible and concerning uptick in the targeting of the media industry online and in person. 
The watchers are being watched, the reporters are being reported on, and the press is being pressed. We have seen repeated attempts to hack into scores of Australian media outlets, so many it appears to be a concerted campaign. The intent is not clear, but we assess they are looking for early warning of stories relevant to the foreign government. The identities of journalist sources, particularly those who are critical of the regime, and ways to shape the reporting and insights that will help them influence, coerce and potentially recruit people working for the media organisation. This influence, coercion and recruitment may take many forms. Foreign intelligence services have used cutouts and front companies to offer funding for programs, almost certainly with the intent to shape the coverage in favour of the foreign government. We have seen journalists, producers and commentators targeted by spies in person, with the spies seeking to influence reporting, discover sources and obtain privileged information. The spies can use diplomatic or journalistic cover, or even pose as sources themselves. They use face-to-face -face meetings to scan for vulnerabilities, develop trusted relationships and generate feelings of indebtedness, all of which can be exploited at a later stage. This unconscionable attacks on journalism and media freedoms are prime examples of why espionage is a threat to our way of life. In more sophisticated cases, the spies use agents or proxies to hide the connection with the foreign government. ASIO uncovered a plot to exploit and potentially recruit senior Australian journalists. We stopped this plot before it was executed. A foreign intelligence service used a person, I'll call the lackey, to do its dirty work. The lackey represented an ideal asset, well connected and well regarded in business and political circles, Australian born and not publicly associated with the overseas government, but all too willing to put its interests ahead of Australia's. A classic example of what we call elite capture. The lackey drew up a list of influential journalists and planned to offer them all expenses paid study tours of a foreign country where the spy masters would enjoy home ground advantage. The idea of a study tour is ironically apt. This is a case study in espionage tradecraft, how spies study and seduce those on tour. Once in country, the lackey was expected to introduce the journalists to local officials, officials who were spies in disguise. The spies would use these opportunities to ingratiate themselves with the reporters, try to elicit insights on pol politics, economics, defence and other issues, and identify vulnerabilities that could be leveraged later. Almost certainly, the journalists' phones, laptops and tablets would have also been targeted. If left unattended, even in a locked hotel safe, the spies would have downloaded data and potentially installed malware, giving them ongoing access to contacts, stories, emails and calls. ASIO intervened before the study tour was arranged and no harm was done. But now the borders have reopened, it's important to know this threat is real. And for all the journalists here who might want to write about this, please don't speculate about which country is involved. As I said before, the variety of governments conducting espionage will surprise you. Foreign intelligence services are skilled at using cutouts to disguise their identities and cover their tracks. So it's possible the lackey did not know who was pulling the strings. But I find that hard to believe. Now, it's okay to go on a fully funded study tour, but you should question who is paying the bills and what are the strings attached. Transparency and accountability are powerful allies here. Know the risks, be careful about the information you provide, don't leave electronic devices unattended, and look out for contact that's suspicious, ongoing, unusual or persistent. You might not be the only person in the room who knows how to cultivate a source. This applies equally to other professions that are being traditionally that have been traditionally targeted by foreign intelligence services. Academics invited to an offshore symposium, defence contractors at an international conference, parliamentarians on, on a political exchange. All these cohorts have been aggressively targeted in the past, and now the international travel is back to normal the in-person, in-country targeting is resuming. The threat environment I'm describing means that Australian individuals, governments and in business and industry must take security seriously. Please don't get me wrong. 
Our national security culture is relatively mature, but as the threats evolve, so must our defences. In the age of terror, we worked hard to harden the physical environment, bollards, security cameras and fences. As a community, we do this well. We harden and secure our places. More recently, there's been considerable focus on cyber security. Obviously, some are better than others at this, but there is a growing awareness that we must secure our systems. What is often overlooked is the third pillar of security, people. The best physical security in the world is useless if an employee turns off the camera or fails to lock the gate. A-grade cybersecurity can be undone and if employee uses password as their password or enables or allows remote access to a system. When it comes to ensuring people take security seriously, Australia can lift its game. Let me give you one example. For some time, I've been warning that foreign spies are targeting Australians on social media. To find out if the message is getting through, I asked my team to quickly scan the best known professional networking sites. They identified nearly 16,000 Australians publicly declaring they have a security clearance and 1,000 more revealing they worked in, in the intelligence community. Now, I appreciate people want to sell themselves to prospective employers and may need to mention they have a security clearance, but doing it on a professional networking site is reckless. These people might as well add high value target to their profile. Security clearances are not titles or rewards. They come with serious ongoing responsibilities. And I don't know what's more disappointing. The people who presumably understand the threat don't seem to care about it, or the individuals trying to promote themselves as security professionals are so unprofessional about security. In 2021, we we're able to identify more than 22,000 Australians using their profiles to show off access to classified information. So it appears my comments, and more importantly, ASIO's Think Before You Link campaign, have had some impact but clearly not enough. The employers are not only the people who are responsible here. Security managers and clearance sponsors have obligations as well. The threat is not going away. In fact, for some professions, it's getting worse. Since the announcement of AUKUS, there's been a distinct uptick in the online targeting of people working in Australia's defence industry. Spies are also turning more attention to non-government employees as well as former clearance holders. These individuals do not have the same security support and reporting obligations as someone who works for ASIO, for example, and are therefore more vulnerable. I'll expand on this in a moment. Regardless of who is being targeted and regardless of how, whether online or in person, the intent is the same. Foreign intelligence services are trying to develop relationships they can exploit. They're hunting for lackeys, witting lackeys and unwitting lackeys. Our toughest adversaries are patient and methodical, willing to grow relationships over years, sometimes decades, in the case the target rises to a position of greater access or influence. And this is why ASIO is stepping up our work with government, business and industry on how to identify and counter what we refer to as insider threats. You can find some of this work on our website. Insiders are current and former employees or contractors who enjoy legitimate access to techniques, activity, activities, technology, assets or facilities. Insiders become insider threats when they disclose sensitive information without authorization, conduct espionage, foreign interference or sabotage, or help third party conduct these activities. For, some in the, for someone in the human intelligence business, a well-placed compliant insider is the ultimate prize. Like the defence employees approached in a Canberra bar by two women who wanted to know everything there is to know about Pine Gap. Fortunately, the defence employees resisted and reported the contact. Now obviously, the overwhelming majority of employees are honest and immune to approaches from foreign intelligence services, but sadly, not all. Insiders can intentionally disclose sensitive information in exchange for money or inducements, or because they feel aggrieved. Insiders can unintentionally disclose sensitive information. An Australian business person travelled overseas and connected a laptop to a hotel Wi-Fi. 
Designs and other forms of intellectual property were stolen and used to make cheap imitations of the company's products, which cost that business billions of dollars in lost revenue. And sometimes even security aware individuals or insiders are outwitted and outplayed. Some time ago, an analyst working in the national intelligence community struck up a relationship with a foreign diplomat. The analyst thought it would be beneficial to gain insights from the diplomat and they began meeting regularly for lunch. At the conclusion of the diplomat's posting, the diplomat introduced the analyst to another diplomat from the same embassy and the lunches continued. When this analyst moved to defence to take up a new role, they were introduced to a third member from the embassy, this time from the defence side. All three so-called diplomats were undeclared intelligence officers. When confronted by ASIO, the analyst was shocked and claimed not to have shared anything. So ASIO showed the analyst the intelligence reports written by the foreign spies. The analyst could not believe how much had been gleaned out of what felt like casual conversations. And at the risk of complicating matters, insiders do not always stay on the inside. For several years now, well before the issue became public, ASIO, through our leadership of the Counter Foreign Interference Task Force, have been tracking former defence insiders willing to sell their military training and expertise to foreign governments. While the overwhelming majority of our veterans are Australian patriots in every sense of the word, a small number, but concerning number, are willing to put cash before country. Third-party companies have offered Australians hundreds of thousands of dollars and other significant perks to help authoritarian regimes improve their combat skills. In some cases, we and our partners have been able to stop the former insiders travelling overseas to provide the training. But in others, legal ambiguities have impeded law enforcement's ability to intervene. However the individuals rationalise their decisions, the bottom line is they are transferring highly sensitive, privileged and classified know-how to foreign governments that do not share our values or the respect for rule of law. These individuals are lackeys, more top tools than top guns. Selling our warfighting skills is no different to selling our secrets, especially when the training and tactics are being transferred to countries that will use them to close capability caps and could use them against us or our allies sometime in the future. My concern is not limited to defence sector either. If we're to take security seriously, Australia needs to ensure our laws and obligations prevent former insiders transferring any form of sensitive know-how to authoritarian regimes. So far I've focused on insiders and, and espionage, but insiders can also enable foreign interference. This manifests most malignly in the harassment of diaspora communities. Foreign intelligence services are actively trying to recruit Australian insiders with access to personal information that will help repress critics of overseas regimes. In the last year, we have identified multiple spies from multiple countries developing and trying to leverage relationships with government officials, bank workers, doctors, police employees and other professions to enable uh, to obtain personal information of perceived dissidents. As far as ASIO is concerned, any insider providing this sort of information is making a very grave mistake. You're not just selling out your employer and the customer, you're enabling foreign interference. You're aiding repression and you're undermining freedoms. You are a lackey of a foreign regime. Insiders have been offered tens of thousands of dollars to do, quote, whatever is necessary to obtain personal data. The spies and their proxies can then use this information to identify, locate, follow, film, harass and intimidate their targets. In extreme cases, the consequences are even more serious. ASIO recently detected and defeated attempts by intelligence services from two countries to physically harm Australian residents. In each case, the target was considered a critic of a foreign regime. In one case, the intelligence service started monitoring a human rights activist and plotted to lure the target offshore where they could, quote, disp be disposed of. In another, a lackey was dispatched to locate specific dissidents and, quote, deal with them. This is what foreign interference can be if left unchecked. This is foreign interference at its most brutal. It is unacceptable and untenable. It is an assault on our sovereignty and an assault on our freedoms. 
Neither of these plots were carried out. Both were stopped before the harm could be done. And while I don't comment on current operational matters, just let me say ASIO has zero tolerance for this despicable behaviour. We have an arsenal of weapons to deal with foreign interference and will use it and did use it in the cases I've outlined. Our resolve more than matches the perpetrator's aggression. While insider threats can be consequential, they are not inevitable. I urge you to lean in to reflect on whether you have an active and effective program to counter inside threats. If your organisation's security record is spotless, I fear your security culture is not. The same goes for other security challenges I've outlined tonight. ASIO is not all-seeing and all-knowing, and the intelligence apparatus of our state-based adversary is meant adversaries is many times larger than ours will ever be. Security is a shared responsibility. We need all our stakeholders to help make Australia a more difficult and expensive place for spies to operate in. How we respond to these challenges matters, not just because it determines success or failure, but also because it speaks to our values. Our greatest strength in the contest with autocratic regimes will always be our democratic values and principles. These things are also powerful tools for preventing radicalisation and promoting social cohesion and preventing communal violence. So as we address these threats, it is right we consider civil liberties and keep under review the right mix of powers to protect people's rights and the safety of the community. I firmly believe that protecting citizen security is not inconsistent with protecting their right to privacy. Far from it. Far from being inconsistent, these things are complementary. ASIO is committed to safeguarding the security of Australians and safeguarding their liberties, protecting from wrongs while securing their rights. In his Royal Commission on the Intelligence Security, Justice Hope recognised that getting this balance is, and I quote, no simple or easy thing to achieve but took the view, and I quote, in the final analysis, public safety and individual liberty sustain each other. We cannot fall into the trap of imagining there is a simple sliding scale of trade-offs between security and rights. This tension between the individual and the collective makes national security hard by design and must be embraced in democracies. As Director General of Security, I strongly believe that appropriate oversight and accountability are critical and I'll continue to promote transparency, one of the reasons why I give this speech. There is an important caveat here though, transparency can only go so far. We must protect ASIO's people, capability, and capabilities and operations. Top secret are top secret for a reason. And while I respect and support open government, open justice and free press, there is a narrow set of circumstances where particularly sensitive information cannot be publicly disclosed in parliament, court or the media. We must protect our people. Our staff are undeclared for their safety. Spies want to target them. Extremists want to kill them. The machete hanging on the wall of one of our buildings is an ugly reminder of this reality. An extremist plotted to use it on one of our offices. We must protect our capabilities. While our people are our most important capability, it's also vital to safeguard their tools, techniques and technologies that allow us to do things Australia's adversaries think are impossible. We must protect our operations or we'll tip off the target and potentially reveal our people and our capabilities. And as Duncan Lewis said, ASIO operates in secret to protect the innocent. And this is why I don't comment on operational matters. In speeches like this, yes, I occasionally um, talk about past operations to give a clearer picture of the threats we face, but only after a rigorous declassification process. Just because a piece of information seems obvious and innocuous to outsiders does not mean it is overclassified. It might have come from a human source, for example, where exposure would identify the source with potentially catastrophic consequences. We must protect these things to take security seriously. Let me repeat, repeat though, Australia's approach to national security is relatively mature. Our architecture is sophisticated and our partnerships are strong. Successive governments at all levels have passed laws and delivered budgets to ensure agencies like ASIO have the powers and capabilities we need. That's one of the reasons why we're able to lower the domestic terrorism threat level. My point is that an environment where espionage and foreign interference is our principal security concern, 
the threats facing Australia are more serious and sophisticated than ever before. And national response must also be more serious and sophisticated. That's certainly how ASIO is responding. We are leaning into the complexity, the challenge and the change. We're expanding our capabilities and sharpening our responses. We are recruiting new people and adapting new tactics. We are taking security extremely seriously and Australia's adversaries know it. Some, in fact, some of the most rewarding feedback I received last year came from several of those adversaries. We're aware of spies from multiple countries complaining to headquarters about how difficult it's become to operate in Australia. Once by whinge to a colleague, I picked the wrong posting. The security service makes this one impossible. Our adversaries might not like us, but they fear us and they definitely respect us. As Director General of Security, I can certainly live with that. Thank you.